All right, so we have three objectives that we're hoping that you will accomplish today. Our first is to really identify, you know, the role of networks related to palliative care in rural communities and why it's such an essential part of it. We're gonna describe some of the examples of palliative care networks, and then to recognize some of the challenges of creating a statewide palliative care network here in North Dakota. And you know why we're going to go probably even further than that when, we, when we're going that way. Let's start out with a case study to ground ourselves in uh, the patients that we hope to help. Uh, Dave and Mary Johnson are an 84 year old couple. Um, they've been married 50 years. They live in a small North Dakota town. Um, and like in many families, their adult children have left North Dakota, uh, now live in California. Dave has atrial fib, COPD, diabetes, and heart failure. Mary has colon cancer that's getting worse, but overall her quality of life good, is good. Their primary physician asks you, what services do we have to help this couple? I would not be at all surprised if either died within the next two years. I like to think of palliative care in a couple ways and very much at the foundation are the kind of the attributes of palliative care or I usually think of this in terms of what are the pillars. And there's many ways to operationalize these pillars. Now, one is a formal program, but there's also many other quality improvement, uh, process changes, um, networking efforts that can also achieve these pillars of palliative care. So pain and symptom management is at the core with a very strong focus on a thorough assessment, treatment interventions, and evaluation of pain and symptom management for people with serious illness. Following that is the unit of care as the family, so psychosocial and spiritual support and practical support for both the patient and family. Third, pillar is information for the patient and family and support to guide their decisions as they learn more about their illness and match that to their goals and values. And then once a care plan is developed and that obviously changes over time to put effort into making sure that that care plan crosses settings, that there is an intentional effort to manage those transitions of care. So our vision for rural palliative care truly comes from quality, you know, that we want programs that are going to be consistent with what Lynn just described across the disease trajectory in all settings, community, being at home, our long-term care, hospitals, clinics, wherever the person resides. And actually we should change the word patients because it can be residents, et cetera, to individuals. But we think of it because it's in medical per perspective when we do it, but it should be when and where the person and family needs it. So it's an on and off ser service uh, that we do that, but it integrates with the current health system that they're working with, not separate. It works in conjunction with them and it should meet and it truly exceed our quality standards. And there are lots of them that are set up to help us guide based on the principles and the pillars that Lynn just described. So when we talk about this, what is a rural health network? And this came directly talk about the functions of effective networks. They provide valuable information, often that's not widely known or available in another way. It's, it's that practical, this is how I went about doing this, that kind of information. That human connection is both fun, rewarding, and expansive. Um, the idea that you can network with someone in another role or in another community and learn firsthand what their experience has been like is, is really invaluable. And it also amplifies your influence. And I think your work um, in the Dakotas has already shown that as people have worked together and been able to uh, demonstrate that kind of collaboration that has led to some grants and other opportunities that really help influence others to support your efforts and help you accomplish things you might not have been able to accomplish without that. But 
but not, not all networks lend themselves to be successful, unfortunately. Um, some of the things that are really important in creating an effective network is to focus on leadership, to have someone or more than one person really have as their, their main function to be the leader of that group as a convener, as someone that can bring people together, as someone that can look for other opportunities for your group. So leadership is really, really important. A second quality of successful networks that I've seen um, in my experience is to have people that represent different organizations, represent different professions, because our scope of influence and our sphere of influence is so different. And bringing those together is, is another quality that makes a network successful. Complementing services and resources, this can be both from an ideas or a shared resource um, across communities. They're creative and collaborative. Um, there isn't um, anyone that needs to own the outcome really, that there's a lot of shared uh, respect and trust among the members. And then willing to engage in mutual problem solving, uh, picking a topic that really appeals to everyone so that you can kind of get in there, roll up your sleeves, and everyone um, work to achieve this 2019, which now is you know like a decade ago, it seems like. Um, in 2019, I, my husband and I did a road trip down to Arizona and then up through the national parks in Utah. And one evening we stopped for dinner in a very small town um, in between some of the parks we were visiting. And here was the sign um, in this restaurant. And at the time, um, I was about to do a, a talk for the Hospice and Palliative Care Nursing Association on Rural Palliative Care. And I thought, oh, this is perfect because it really points out a very important um, attribute of folks that are living in rural communities. And that's the pride you have in what you're able to bring to your community community members. So I don't know if anyone at this restaurant knows I've used this slide um, over and over, but I just really like it. And Nancy said, send it in. It'll be great for this PowerPoint. So, so here it is. It's fantastic. I absolutely love it because it, it does state exactly, you know, what, we, what we're all about in a rural setting. So let's talk a little more about what some of those positive rural attributes are. I think uniquely, uh, people who live in smaller communities, rural communities are so committed to their neighbors, to the, their, their church communities, to their social communities, to their schools. And there's a degree of commitment and helpfulness that um, you don't see in large urban areas typically. Um, there's a ton of experience in figuring things out looking at a problem and say, well, here's the problem. We need a solution. How are we going to get there? People wear many hats. You know, if you've ever worked in a, a rural hospital, you probably weren't just the medical nurse or med surgeon nurse even. You probably went down to the emergency room and maybe even to the OB unit. Um, so that flexibility, uh, again, is a key attribute in um, rural communities. You know the people, you know the culture, you know the history, you know the organizations and how things have worked in the past and, and can see possibilities for the future. And you also bring your own unique perspective um, to a table that's probably small enough that all the voices can be heard. And that too is a really important attribute of, of rural communities. So when we're looking at um, developing what we have here in North Dakota, we, we really know um, there's distance issues and isolations that are there. We have much more isolated population um, and aging that's going on. Definitely economic and cultural disparities. We have so much frontier area that is there. And then the cost, of course, with healthcare as it continues to grow. You know, thank goodness we have things like telehealth now you know, um, with broadband, et cetera, that's helping for some connection there, but there de definitely gets to be some, some things that we do need to work through here. 
we can think about networks in a couple of ways. Certainly one uh, way to think about that is, is really to start with those people and organizations that are in your kind of immediate vicinity. And when you develop a, a clinical program, often you're looking for champions and stakeholders. And so you create a network that goes, kind of surrounds your, your clinical program to make it as successful as possible. Expanding that, there's also examples of regional networks that support multiple programs, um, multiple clinicians, and may share those community resources we mentioned. And regional networks learned learn through their shared commitment to goals and really leverage the fact that all the members have valuable experience to share. And then on a national and as well international level, but national level, groups come together to promote educational goals, to promote policy changes, to promote legislation, um, and also to do some of that dissemination um, that's so important about knowledge as we continue to acquire new learnings and to keep that awareness objective in front of folks because it's no secret to anyone that there's still a lot of misconceptions and lack of understanding of what palliative care and how best to care um, for people with serious illness. Statewide, uh, here's a picture of our uh, Midwest um, area and some of the potential for bringing together collaboration from our immediate geographic neighbors. So this is our North Dakota when we did our rural uh, community-based palliative care. These were the participating communities, which is very exciting. Uh, we started off with uh, eight, grew to nine, and have added two more. So uh, yeah, so we're up to 11 now. So we're very excited. And if you notice, 38 of our, our 53 counties are designated as frontier, less than seven people per square mile. And it's just, it's, it's amazing. And I'm so glad that we were able to tap into some of those communities and valuable, valuable information that we gathered from that as we got closer and closer to networking with this project that we did do. We did start expanding uh, thanks to um, the Center uh, for Rural Health with our Project ECHO for palliative care. And this whole project that we're doing today, you know, was totally based on how to get disseminate the information, uh, you know, using the needs of the most vulnerable populations by equipping the rural communities with the right knowledge, right place, right time, and deliver high quality care without having to move the individuals all the time, which was such a valuable, valuable component of that. We also developed a North Dakota Palliative Care Task Force. It was most active between 2014-15 um, through 2018. And our biggest goal is that we came up with our definition, which included a, a, a full definition with a diagram and distinction palliative care or hospice. That was our biggest thing that we did. But our goal was to commit to improving the quality of life of those facing health conditions by promoting patient-centered palliative care and improving access to services. That was our ultimate goal that we're working on. And we're actually looking at both bringing back our task force. Charlene, do you wanna, you're on. So do you mind talking about it? Charlene is our South Dakota person today. So this is perfect. <laughs> Uh, what we're doing in South Dakota for yes, our palliative please. care network. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, well, back in 2018, we um, initiated our palliative care network within South Dakota. We received a um, HRSA grant, uh, planning grant, um, to be able to do a needs assessment about what is palliative care in South Dakota. And um, the number one thing, which you know, I'm speaking to the choir here, the number one thing that came out in that assessment was people didn't have a good understanding of what palliative care was. And then um, well, the other two were reimbursement and then supporting the um, facilities that did have a palliative care designated program. And you know, the next thing we did is our governing board got together and said, well, you can't really move much forward unless you provide that base level education. And so thus um, prompted a 
second grant application to HRSA to focus on providing education. And we came up with this three-prong approach um, and we focused on emerging healthcare professionals and we focused mainly on the nursing students. We had connections um, with three of the universities, um, SDSU, um, Mount Marty and Presentation College up in Aberdeen. And then the second aim was providing education to current healthcare professionals um, in regards to um, what is palliative care. And then the third is doing some community education. And our hope um, as we started off with our community education that we would be able to follow the Stratus Health um, template um, and utilize that toolkit that was um, developed. And so we have two community education um, events under our belt so far. Um, and our um, goal is to be able to have 16 by the end of our project, which is the June of next year. So, anything specific, Nancy? Well, can, you, can you address what you're doing for the healthcare professionals, what you guys so, have done? So we have um, a CE portal that will event hopefully by the end of the month have um, 12 education sessions on it. And the first one um, and the most popular is what is palliative care? And I was just on that um, today, 63 people have um, taken that education. We have almost a hundred people registered for the series. And so, you know, with um, having a grant, you know, you have to data points that you need to get. And so we have a registration process you need to complete first and then um, and then you get access or a code to be able to complete all the other education uh, free of charge so that's fantastic thank you sorry to put you on the spot but it's perfect timing versus my <laughs> trying to explain it <laughs> yeah I, I, I know it <laughs> works <Thank> well <laughs> So this is uh, our Stratus Health uh, work that I alluded to at the, at the beginning. Um, and this shows the uh, three rounds of cohorts that we did. And as an example of networking, uh, this whole idea really started with the state of Minnesota's cancer committee through the Department of Health. And the steering committee had a variety of people on it from uh, uh, different organizations and backgrounds. And one of the members of this committee was the uh, CEO of Stratus Health, Jennifer Lundblad. Mm. And I was on the committee probably representing oncology nursing at the time. And I just moved into to the palliative care field too. And I thought, um, I had no idea what Stratus Health really did. Uh, but I really liked Jennifer. And I thought she her, you know, all her contributions at these meetings were just spot on and, and she was so articulate and, and seemed to be so engaged with the, uh, the cancer work that I thought, I'm just gonna see if whatever her organization does, if they have any interest um, in collaborating on palliative care. And that was really the initial conversation that led to the creation of an advisory board and led to some grant applications and over probably 15 years of work uh, that Stratus Health has supported in rural palliative care. And it began with 10 communities who applied to be part of this, uh, like an Institute for Healthcare Improvement Collaborative. We met in person for three sessions. We did mentoring in between. Um, it was all structured on small tests of change and what those community assessments showed were the high impact areas to work on. And then develop there so that each of those 10 communities was at a different phase when we started, but they all moved down the timeline of developing programming and services for people in their community. There were some established relationships, some new relationships created, um, and the group was a very effective uh, statewide regional network for using one another's talents and abilities to uh, move forward with, with palliative care development. Next slide. Another example is the Minnesota Network for Hospice and Palliative Care that started uh, years ago as the Minnesota Hospice Association. 
and then changed their name and their mission to encompass um, palliative care. And they have created a very effective network. They hold a regional conference that if you haven't been is definitely worth attending or signing onto your computer um, as it's been virtual the last couple of years. And they also developed a directory where programs submitted their services, palliative care programs submitted what they had in place to MNHPC and they created a registry so that if, if you were someone looking for uh, what nursing homes say in Alexandria, Minnesota had any kind of palliative care services, you could use that directory to, to find out those that had really invested time and in, in programming in palliative care. So a really effective group, um, interdisciplinary, does some, does some really nice work. And they're, they're, they're uh, virtual. It's going to be virtual again this year, and it's September 29th and 30th. So um, again, you know, it's, it's worth the information and continuing education, et cetera, for that, for their conference. The California Health Foundation, though, quite a ways from um, our geographic area that we're representing today, um, is another uh, state that has a large amount of rural communities. We think of our big cities uh, in California, but up in the northern part, it's very, very rural and probably borders on, on frontier. The California Health Found, Healthcare Foundation is another group that's invested heavily in helping communities develop palliative care services with a focus on rural public health, public hospitals and organizations that hadn't really had the ability to uh, create palliative care programs without some assistance and support. One of their projects uh, was to team uh, health care providers palliative care provider agencies, most of these were community-based with health plans. So the health plans identified members that lived in these rural communities and they, they really partnered together to figure out how do we identify these people? How do we reach out to them? Once we know who they are, what happens? And developing those processes and uh, adding clinical capacity to the, the staff in the palliative care programs to be able to meet that increased need. Uh, so really an excellent uh, project. And again, it's available for free on their website. You can see how they did it and uh, what the actual clinical outcomes were. That's, that's very interesting, you know, to know that they went to that extreme with doing that. Mm -hmm. And I know now that they're looking at for community uh, reimbursement for a palliative care team, interdisciplinary team, both through Medicaid and their payers there. So they're setting a real nice precedence for all of our, for all, all over. So I'm very excited about um, the health foundation out there to do this. I think our next section is to look at a little broader network, regional and national networks. We have some examples um, on the next couple of slides. Let's see, I think this is mine, right? Because <laughs> I was born in Wisconsin, so I claim this one. Uh, the Palliative Care Network of Wisconsin, or PC Now, has been in existence probably 10 or 15 years. And they too have really brought people together uh, to augment what they can do in that state. They are probably, uh, one of the things they're best known for is their uh, fast facts, which are one page teaching tools on different topics uh, in palliative care that are uh, fabulous to give you a quick review of, of um, what's the latest knowledge and resource research in, in palliative care. They've worked on educational um, opportunities and created some products in that way. They've also used mentoring and networking to develop programs within their health systems, and then also in an advocacy role uh, to work with the Wisconsin State Legislature on palliative care. And one other thing too, um, FastFax has an app now, so you can actually have it on your phone and at your fingertips. I just love that. It's so exciting to have that there. NHPCO is probably well known to uh, most of you, but that is another organization that has evolved over time and has embraced the uh, focus on hospice, but enhanced that 
with um, looking at especially community-based palliative care and how palliative care groups can work more closely with hospice and really create that continuum for people with serious illness. And that requires a membership. And is it only organizations that can do it or can individuals join NHPCO? Do you know that? I don't know that. That's a good question, Nancy. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one either. Um, I know, I know our state is, you know, that North Dakota hospice organization is a, a member, but I don't know if individually people can join. But I do, I do know it requires um, membership on that one. The Hospice and Palliative Nursing Association is uh, the membership and education arm um, for nurses in hospice and palliative care. They have groups for advanced practice nurses, RNs, LPNs, and nursing assistants. They also offer certification to all of those groups, which is really, really cool that they have prioritized the entire nursing care team in that way. Offer educational conferences. There are uh, emails on their community digest where you can pose a question and get a discussion going from others on the forum and really are focused on expert care. Uh, that is their new kind of um, sideline uh, name, advancing expert care. So very much focused on evidence-based practice, research, uh, increasing the clinical com capacity of uh, nurses in hospice and palliative care. They have some online educational opportunities, RN Polaris, and we're currently working on um, an online educational uh, program for advanced practice nurses in hospice and palliative care too, that'll probably be finished this calendar year. Excellent. I was going to ask about that. And I, I know that um, we, we haven't addressed them, but there are some for social work. Um, there's a social work association for palliative. And I think, and I, I don't think we pulled that one up and also chaplaincy. I think there's one specifically for certification for those two as well. <clears throat> the Center to Advance Palliative Care, CAPSI, um, is well known. It provides definitely essential tools training, technical assistance, and connection for clinicians caring for people, serious illness. And they're calling it serious illness now. I just really like that that's the big umbrella um, and with the definition of what serious illness involves. And um, again, people, not patients, you know, and their families, of course, it's there. There are a lot of things that are available to public, but you can also become members um, uh, through an organization. And um, then there's all kinds of um, ongoing, you can get a designated component of that with some of the education that's there and moving forward with that. And uh, we, we could spend an hour just looking at their website with all the different things that are available there. The other one that a lot of people don't know about is NASHP, the National Academy for State Health Policy. And they have a framework specifically for how to get palliative care at the state level you know, for developing um, an agent of change, that whole quality. And this is so nice to have to foster that access for palliative care services that are, that are available for people. And so I encourage people to really look at that and see the different steps that you can take to move forward at a state level. And that's one of the things since we're looking at North Dakota that we're taking on that challenge as well. There's also the National Post. Um, organization. Um, it's now called simply Pulse Portable Medical Orders um, nationally, Pulse for short, as we know, um, but that honors those wishes of people with serious illness and frailty. And those are those people that you wouldn't be surprised in the next year, you know, type thing. It's not across the whole continuum up there, but it really organizes the efforts to standardize the process, the form, and education throughout the United States, since it does vary from state to state. But it's one part of the whole advanced care planning thing where it translates that, that uh, person's wishes into a medical order, which is such a, a needed thing um, in, in our world these days, for sure, especially with all the uh, COVID pandemic things that are going on for those people that are nearing the end of life. Ariadne Labs is another one. They have the serious illness program. Um, I've been fortunate to be one of their ambassadors for that and helping to support the serious illness conversation guide 
and it redesigns. They, they just came out with this great one um, with you know messaging and how to send the message uh, for people to really understand a uh, person's priorities to become the norm, not the exception to where it is. And they really look at system level delivery of care model um, as a team for palliative care. So they use their experts to do this and they have lots and lots of availability online for people to be able to use. With the ultimate goal is that every single person with serious illness has a better a earlier conversation with clinicians about these goals and values and priorities so that future care can be developed based on that. And it's just, it's a fantastic organization. All you need is an email to get in and, and you're a member. And it's, it's just a very, very good thing to do. They have lots and lots of um, um, presentations that you can go through. They have um, modified forms that are there, um, changing verbiage so that it makes more sense to people and not from just a healthcare delivery um, perspective, which is really, really nice. CTAC, the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care, um, is um, kind of the mothership. Everybody falls under this, which is really, really nice. So it also is dedicated to improving the lives of underserved and under-resourced people impacted by serious illness, which is a lot, a lot of people. So it works with regulators, legislators, advocates, and funders to craft those policies that are going to be equitable, comprehensive, accessible to support people, their families, and all those unpaid caregivers. That's one area that we don't talk a lot about, which is very nice. And they use unbiased sources of expertise on this. Over 190 organizations share that vision to move this forward, to serve and honor the dignity and the needs of the person as they see it, not from our perspective, which I really like CTAC. The Palliative Care Network is an international one. The mission of this one is to provide a digital platform aimed at promoting palliative care education and collaboration globally. So this is another one you know, where palliative care is for everyone everywhere. And so this is kind of the next big one that is out there. It's not as well known as CTAC, but um, CTAC is more of our national one. This one is our global or international one that is there. So our last section is final thoughts. And the next slide really could have been our, um, our opening slide if you wanna pull that one up. Um, the important essential role of self-care and developing resiliency for everyone working in this field. Um, and this is something when you're caught up in the uh, tremendous work of creating a program or creating a network um, is really important to pay attention to because all the development work is really, really exciting and fun and it's great to see progress. Uh, but the um, other side of that is really to balance a focus on you, your team, your colleagues, um, efforts to sustain this work because it's hard work. and. Uh, the importance of self-care, developing resiliency skills is something that you as a network can prioritize and really build into your, to your plan. So I can't, can't emphasize that enough. It's just really essential um, for people working with patients and um, families in, with serious illness. We're going to also just pause to talk a little bit about a case study that uh, is not so much focused on creating a clinical program, but more on the operational side of how networking can help uh, develop and sustain a clinical program. So this was a very small home care organization, and it was in a rural state that I was uh, working with. And the uh, motivation from leadership and from the employees to build a palliative home care program was very, very strong. And they had hired individuals to focus uh, part of their role on developing palliative care and to really be the, the clinical arm that brought services to people in their community. And then as happens, uh, both leadership changed and uh, people were asked to assume other clinical roles. So from the core staff that had gone through initial training and was committed and had uh, been part of the launch of the program, um, others were now left to carry that on. 
And being part of a network for this clinical program was really essential because those that were new to their roles in um, palliative care and in leading the program could network with others in the state organization to figure out how are we gonna handle this now? How are we gonna go forward? What is it that we need to do? And some of it was very practical things like does anybody have a, a care plan that really focuses on palliative care needs that we can bring into our, our organization? And how do, we, how do we balance bringing palliative care expertise with people and their families who um, needed home care, who needed DME? Is that something we combine in a role or is that something that we try to keep, keep separate? How do we work with our home care organizations? So the, uh, the good news is that despite the, the bumps that this organization um, encountered, they were able to continue to um, grow their program. And uh, their main outcome, of course, was to bring palliative care to the, the residents um, of their community. Networking was really, really key um, to their survival. I think they would have just kind of died on the vine and wouldn't have um, moved forward if they hadn't had the support of a, of a networking um, relationship um, supporting them. Was, uh, was there any issues um, to put you on, not to put you on the spot too much, but with uh, competition or conflict of interest in this area? You know, like you said, when they're sharing like the care plans or anything like that. Um, you know, there really wasn't. Um, sometimes we had to create what they were asking for, uh, but there really wasn't any um, ownership problems or uh, people are just so eager to share. And that was my experience with the Stratus Health Minnesota Initiative as well. Uh, that boy, if I spend 20 hours developing this and you can use it, please go ahead, um, go ahead and, and use it. Uh, and that was our experience in, in this case as well. And I'm finding that truly in the palliative world in general is it's let's share, let's network, let's make this work for everybody. Cause we, we don't, that whole ownership thing doesn't seem to be quite as much challenging as you know, or the, or the uh, competition side of it. So very, very exciting. So I'm glad think, you're seeing it too. <laughs> many times where someone will share an idea and the others will say, Oh, I never thought of it that way, or I never thought that would work, but I think I'm going to try that. And that's just invaluable, of course. So um, big fan of networking. I, I have to share that through our Honoring Choices North Dakota, which I should have included that one. That's interesting. I didn't include that one. But um, we had two DNP students. One was doing it for pro healthcare providers and one was doing for community on advanced care planning. And so they wanted to utilize some of our materials. Can we share some of this and that? And, and all we asked is attribution, you know, just, you know, give some attribution to us, but we're more than happy to share. So um, that was very exciting too. You know, the more that we can move it forward, the better that it seems to be to going forward. So let's get back to our couple, Dave and Mary Johnson and uh, kudos to Nancy for finding this so appropriate photo, I think. Um, so after the efforts of the community to develop their palliative care services, uh, they were able to access a program that brought them um, palliative care services, probably advanced care planning um, through the home care agency and also through a primary care clinic. So maybe they providers there participated in the Ariande serious illness communication training, um, but the processes were put in place so that they could, Dave and Mary could access this. Through these services, both were able to have their wishes recorded in the medical record and then shared with, the, with their adult children ahead of the emergency room, ahead of the ICU admission. Um, the palliative care program was able to find volunteer services to check on their well being weekly. And they both were in a fairly stable health pattern um, until their illnesses uh, became more complicated and they were eventually admitted to hospice program. So, another success story. Yeah, just curious along the journey, did either one have to be the caregiver for the other one when they all have their own health issues going on? <laughs> it was one of those situations where um, there's a star in the sky that aligns because 
what one couldn't do, the other could. And so there was very much a symbiotic relationship so that they were able to keep going with you know, increasing support. Volunteer services worked for a while, but then they needed a little bit more. And um, as, they're, as they ended up qualifying for hospice, that seemed to be you know, the very best program to allow them to maintain their quality of life for as long as possible. One of the things that we know that you have, and just recently South Dakota has, has added, but North Dakota is looking at getting community health workers. We've had community health representatives through the tribal and IHS for, for years and years and years, but now we're looking at, you know, we have and, and designated the difference between and filling those gaps from what a quality service provider does, uh, CNA does, you know, all those kind of things. And we think that that's going to really help to build the workforce uh, for a community and rural settings. So that's one of our very exciting things we're moving forward with as well too. Pretty exciting. Excellent, Excellent work. So in conclusion, uh, as you can tell from, from our um, comments today, we really believe that palliative care networking can offer a significant benefit. And you can think of that both locally in your community and then think um, in concentric circles to the state, region, national uh, level, and that strategies can be created to meet some of those challenges that Nancy outlined um, earlier for communities in North Dakota, build on what others have done, take what works, discard what doesn't, and um, move the field forward so that you can bring this very person-centered, family-centered care for people with serious illness in your communities. And we have a download for doing that, uh, which is very, very, uh, it's a very good video um, to help uh, establish some of that. Our RHI hub um, has excellent, excellent things about all of the things related to rural hospice and palliative care from um, definition and crossing over to what we've added already. Some of the implications for beneficial things of it. Uh, Community-based palliative care re final report from Stratus is right here for people to be able to look at, you know, what types of service that are there, um, who's included in there. So that information is available as we look forward towards networking that we have yet a resource for people to look at. Um, here's your article, and it's actually, or it was a PowerPoint that um, brought me back to, oh yes, this is great um, for how to create it and some of the information that we've shared today. So again, I think Lynn, she was one of my mentors from get-go and has been so, so helpful for that. Um, and still, like you, you said, even in your semi-retirement, you're still very active with the Hospice Palliative Nurses Association, et cetera. The Palliative Care Network that we, we showed as well um, from, from the uh, global level, they have everything from the stories on the edge, some resources, blog, community forums, a directory, how to contact, and of course to donate, <laughs> which, is, which is there. And then uh, the Home on the Range, here's the California one, uh, which is a great article. Um, that um, Lynn brought up when she was talking about how, how to do this and um, has you know healthcare that works for all Californians because Northern California is so similar to our world. So networking with rural uh, palliative care, our ultimate goal would be awesome face-to-face -face in our world of <laughs> COVID. <laughs> Sometimes we do, you know, that would be our preference, but email or virtual, even telephonic might be there. Um, there are lots of other ones that are there. There's, there's no right or wrong answer here. This is truly, what would you think? You know, what would you be your best motive to be able to do that? Lynn, comment on that one. You, you're on mute, Lynn. <laughs> yeah, um, I had to move some things around to find the mute button. Uh, the... The benefit of face-to-face, -face, at least initially, I think is huge um, because once you, if there's individuals that you haven't met before, having that ability to put names and faces together, even if successive encounters are virtual, uh, is really helpful, I think, to create that basic trust and interest and um, the seeds that are so effective with collaboration. So. I'm glad people were thinking that would be their preferred way 
uh, it definitely can be a very good foundation even again if you move to virtual just to even expand access to move it to virtual um, that initial face-to-face -face could be very helpful. what are some of advantages uh, versus what is you know an advantage because we said single choices versus all of the choices here so we had listed new information the education component connection with others peer-to-peer -peer connection and engaging in creating um, active participation locally. So Lynn? Um, I agree. I think that's a huge advantage, uh, meeting others, being able to call on them when you need them. Um, that human connection just seems to explode opportunities for at least, especially people in healthcare who tend to like to be with others and, and learn um, in that way. Uh, it's definitely a, a really important part of, of networking. And, and from there, though, you might have the other components, but that would be the priority one, would be the connection component. If we got a minute more. Um, so in that Stratus Health initiative, one of the, um, you had said the Institute had to apply for um, an application to have that process. Um, started for their community. What did that application process look like? Um, well, the fun thing was that we had probably 25 applications for 10 spots with very little uh, introduction to it. It just demonstrated how much interest there was. So the application was several pages and it was asking questions about, you know, who would be involved, who from the local healthcare agencies has given their support from a leadership perspective. Um, would you be able to bring together, say, as the people from the hospital, the hospice organization, um, area on aging, um, a school of nursing was a member of one of the groups, um, pharmacy, uh, clergy people. So who would want to come together from your organization? Did you have a hospice in place? That was a requirement. Um, and just had you done any kind of baseline needs assessment, do you have any thought of where you would start? And uh, some did, some didn't. Um, some had some services in place already because they had gotten a little farther on their, on their journey. Um, but we picked the programs we thought represented regional areas in the state and also seemed to have the kind of the key ingredients for success. They had leadership, leadership support, um, and had a, a group, kind of a nucleus of people that wanted to come together to work on um, developing capacity in their community for palliative care. Does that answer, Charlene? We have, um, and when we did it in North Dakota, we have a lot of places that do not have hospice available. And so what we did was we, that's why Project ECHO was available and we had other people we could reach out to to help facilitate that. And we also developed um, policies for nearing end of life, et cetera, that were available for people um, without hospice available. So that was one thing that was kind of, how did we do get over that not having hospice? Mm -hmm. Because we didn't want it limited and we did want to hit those frontier areas.